From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar, Mrs. Galen. I think Mr. Welch told you I'd be around to see you. Oh, yes. You're the special investigator the insurance company sent out. That's right. Mind if I come in? All right, Mr. Dollar. Thanks. In through here. Your company didn't waste any time, did they? Sending you out here, I mean. No. No more than you did in filing your claim. I have a right to it. With Eddie gone now, I, I need the money. I see. Sit down. Thanks. How many keys are there to that door? Keys? What do you mean? Your front door. How many keys do you have? Just one. And of course, Eddie had one. Why? What difference does it make? Just about enough difference to hang somebody. Cigarette, Mrs. Kalen. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, to the home office, Trinity Mutual Insurance Company Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Kalen Matter. Expense account continued. That's quite a dramatic statement, Mr. Dollar. Are you prepared to name that somebody who may get hanged? Not at the moment. Could it be that you don't have a name? Mm, that's possible, of course. That you're just fishing, so to speak? Bluffing? Now, why would I do that with you? I don't know, frankly, but you must have come here for some reason. Yes, I wanted to ask you a few questions. And you'd be smart to answer them under the circumstances. What circumstances? The only one I know anything about is the tragic one of losing my husband only three days ago. You have my sympathy, Mrs. Kalen. Sergeant Renosa questioned me for hours. There's nothing more to answer. Will you go now, please? All right, if you say so. Your unwillingness to cooperate will undoubtedly prejudice your claim for the insurance. That's all you care about, isn't it? Finding some excuse for not paying off the policy. Now, wait a minute, Mrs. Kalen. I'm not crooked and neither is the company. If a claim is legitimate, they pay it, always. I'm sick of being under suspicion, of being accused. I'm not accusing you of anything. All I'm after is some information. And if you refuse to give it... Good night, Mrs. Kalen. No, wait. Wait, Mr. Dollar. Yes? Don't go. Come back, please. I'm sorry. Been under such a strain on edge, forgive me. That's all right, forget it. I didn't mean what I said, but I've answered so many questions. And to go through all of it again, well, it seems so pointless. Yes, I understand. But I've found that people say things to me sometimes that they forget to say to the police. They're uh, more relaxed, I guess. Don't feel they're on the spot so much. That's true. But I thought it was just me. Oh, no, you're not alone. I remembered something like that after I talked to Sergeant Renosa. He wanted to know where Eddie hung out, mostly. Bars and so on. I could only think of two. What are the names of the bars, Mrs. Keelan? Uh, the, uh, the Eloines on Beverly Boulevard and the Brass Monkey Inn down on the Strip. What difference does it make? Eddie wasn't killed in a bar. No, but he probably met people there, talked to them. You see, it's a matter now of trying to reconstruct his life step by step, right up to the moment he died. You'd be surprised how much bartenders see and hear. And remember... I suppose they do. All right, Mr. Dollar. I'll be glad to answer any questions you want to ask. Good. One thing, though. I wasn't expecting visitors, of course, and I wonder if I could have just five minutes to change and freshen up a little. Oh, well, that's unnecessary. I won't be here long. But I'd feel better, really. Do you mind? No, no, of course not. Go ahead. I'll be right back. Pour yourself a drink, Johnny. I had the drink and waited and got ready to brace myself. <laughs> I've been through this before. Attack plan number two, a common garden variety. When you can't beat them, join them. And when the joiner is a lovely woman, the maneuver usually starts with some paraphrase of, uh, slip into something more comfortable. Why don't you have a drink? And a sudden switch to first names. And it always ends up with you and I against the world. And, uh, couldn't you forget just one little mistake? The little mistake being something like arsenic in a husband's coffee. Yeah, an old familiar pattern. 
And a first resort just as often as a last. She was gone 20 minutes, not five, but it was time well spent. A carefully casual touch with the hair. Makeup skillfully softened. Perfume. And one of those frothy nylon jobs designed for that special evening in. Bugle call, charge. Like another drink, Johnny. Uh, thanks. Uh, I still have some. I think I could use one. Would you mind? Sure. What do you have? Scotch and soda, please. Thanks for being so patient. I feel better now. More uh, comfortable, huh? Something like that. Easy on the soda. Right. There you are, Mrs. Keelan. Thanks. Would you do something else for me? Oh, I'd be happy to. But I don't know your first name. Touche. All right. What are your questions? How do you think it happened? I don't know. Not some enemy, because Eddie didn't have any. Just friends. Too many friends. Who are some of them? There's only one who really fits the definition, who, who's really lasted. His name is Pete Steimer. Pete Steimer? Where can I find him? You can't. Or at least the police haven't been able to. Nobody's seen him since that night. He's had nightclubs off and on, and in between he makes books. What about those other friends, the ones who don't last? <laughs> they drift in, drift out, depending mostly on whether Eddie had any money at the moment. Of course, there were women. Oh? Showgirls, mostly dancers, strippers, so on. Know any of them? Hardly. Ever hear any of their names? Always made a point not to. Otherwise, I'd have killed him long ago. Did you kill him, Mrs. Kalen? No. Did you love him? That's a good question. I think I'll have to pass it, though. I don't really know. I feel all hollow, smashed up inside over what happened. And yet there were times I'd have killed him myself if I'd had a gun. But there were other times, too, when it was so crazy sweet you wanted to die. Because you knew it'd never be like that again. Yeah, that's the way it was with Eddie. Mad, mixed up. Like watching a ten-ring circus from the front seat in a roller coaster. That's why women flocked around him. That's why they always ran from him later. You didn't run. Could I have another drink? Oh, Sure. Were you trying to run when you went up to Arrowhead by yourself? Maybe. We had a fight. I ran out and told him I wasn't coming back. And only three days later, over the radio, I heard where he'd been found dead. Burned up in his car. Here you go. I guess they call it shock. I still can't really believe it even though I know it's true. Well, I guess you should know. I understand you're the one who identified the body. I identified a wallet. Burned black. A wristwatch, a ring. All of them things I'd bought for him. They told me there wasn't anything that... could be called a body. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, Mrs. Kalen. I know this is painful it's for all you. It's all right. Like I said, I, I can't believe it. Not really. Do you have any other reason for not believing Eddie is really dead? I mean, besides just a feeling. No. No, of course not. What do you mean? What do you mean? Well, no, it's just a question, that's all. Forget it. But I... Let's get have... back for a moment to another question. You said you were sure it wasn't some personal enemy who killed your husband. Then what do you think? Well, the same as the police, I guess. They said Eddie won a lot of money that night from some gambler named Topo Leanley. You don't know this Topo Lanely, huh? No, but I suppose that's why Eddie was killed. The money wasn't found, so I guess it was robbery. Did you know about the money? Well, it all happened while I was up at Arrowhead. Anyway, if Eddie ever had any money, I'd be the last one to know about it. He always spent his money where it would show, where he'd get something for it. Laughs, bells, whistles, balloons going up. But not at home. Never. Yeah, I'm well... sorry. Forget I said that. I hate women who sit around drooling with self-pity. Like you said, I didn't run. I guess maybe I did love him, Mr. Dollar. 
Is there anything else you... No, no, I guess not. At least not tonight. You look a little beat. Yes, I'm afraid I am. You go around trying to keep up a front, but it's been rough. Yeah, I imagine. Well... That business a while ago, fixing myself up a little. This robe. I just had to do it. There are times when a woman has to feel like a woman in order to feel anything, even sane. I guess you wouldn't understand, though. And I'm afraid I gave the wrong impression. No. I think I do understand now. And I also think I owe you an apology. For what? For walking in here with a preconceived opinion, for being rude, being wrong. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Forgiven. Forgotten. And come back again, please. Regardless. I might, on one condition. Yes? Your first name. Would you mind? <laughs> it's Lila. Thanks, Lila. Good night. Good night. I caught a flash of movement from the corner of my eye and whirled around just in time to see somebody slip off the corner of the terrace and edge into the shadows of the shrubbery. I stepped off the porch and moved toward the dark hedge of banana and scrub palm. I was watching for a sudden attack, but nothing happened. Then I heard a slight sound on the next terrace level up the slope, a rustle of bushes, an accidental scrape of a shoe on the cement walk, and I slipped along the walk. I stopped at the head of the steps and listened. Nothing. The only way out of the patio to reach the street was to come past me. I started searching. But even though I was on guard when the attack came, it caught me off balance. All I could see was a dark shape and the glint of metal in an upraised fist. I grabbed the arm and twisted and drove my left into his stomach and again. He rolled to his knees and raised his right hand and again I saw the glint of metal. I jumped for him, grabbed his hand, twisted it back. And at the same time, I swung my foot and kicked him in the jaw. Johnny! Johnny, are you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. Call Sergeant Reynosa, will you, Lila? He was out cold. I turned him over on his back and struck a match to get a look at him. He was a big man, stocky, bull-necked, blonde-haired. I slid my hand inside his coat and fished out his wallet and opened it. His name was Topo Lili. Now, here is our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, we meet a Latin doll from Santa Monica, an erudite bartender, and a Terpsichorean ecdysiast. And they're all in the cast. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Roy Rowan speaking.